This is a chart from Bloomberg New Energy. This is uh, looking at how much have, did the world spend on clean energy technologies across different years. And in 2004, he is the world spent $32 billion a year on clean energy, primarily on solar and wind. $32 billion is not small. That's a very meaningful market. But look at what happened in the growth in the next 18 years to 2022. In 2022, we spent between 1.1 trillion, if you ask Bloomberg, to 1.4 trillion, if you ask the International Energy Agency, on the deployment of clean energy technologies, primarily solar and electric vehicles and the batteries for them. Uh, welcome to Transformation Talk. Uh, I'm Tairo Hassan, uh, the director of Brightline at uh, the Project Management Institute. And uh, the title of our talk today is, as you've seen, is Energy Disrupted, Disruption in the Energy Sector. As we know, uh, the global economy is in the early and accelerating stages of a multi-hundred trillion dollar transition from fossil uh, fuels to cleaner, cheaper, and more abundant energy future. Of course, uh, clean energy technologies such as solar, wind, battery, electric vehicles, hydrogen are dropping exponentially in terms of cost and they are increasingly becoming the cheaper source of energy. Of course, if you look at every business, government, family around the world will be impacted by the disruptive trans the transition away from polluting legacy technologies toward the clean energy future. And to discuss really the challenge and opportunities ahead, we are privileged to welcome Ramez Nam, who is a climate and clean energy investor, one of the foremost thinker and predictor on clean energy and climate tech. He will help us actually chart a path to save as we'll save the world and to profit also by doing so. Please allow me to say a few words about Ramez. Ramez is the founder of uh, Managing Partner and Planetary VC, it, which helps really and invest in startups addressing the world's greatest challenges. Ramez has spent the past decade investing in climate and energy technology, and he's speaking around the world on the topic of the future of energy and the climate. As you may know, or you'll discover, he's one of the first actually to chart the exponential cost declines of clean energy, such as solar, batteries, and electric vehicles, and to predict actually that the clean energy and transport would become cheaper than fossil uh, fuels. Ramel is uh, the co-chair for energy and environment at Singularity University. This is actually where I met Ramez uh, five years ago. Uh, in 2018 when uh, I attended the Singularity University Executive Program. He is an award-winning uh, author of five books, including Nexus Trilogy of Science Fiction Novels. And uh, Ramez has spent uh, about 13 years at Microsoft, leading teams working on emails, internet search, and machine learning. Last but not least, he's the author of more than 20 patents, and many of them actually co-invented with Bill Gates. Welcome, Ramez. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, hello to people around the world. I, I see the, the large number of countries that we have represented today. So let's talk about the future of energy and the disruption coming in the energy sector. Uh, as you heard about me, uh, my background is uh, really in tech. I spent 13 years at Microsoft working in software. I founded a internet startup. Uh, in the early days, and for the last, well, 13 years now, I've been part of Singularity University, where we look at using exponential technologies to advance the state of humanity. Because for me, in about 2010, I came from a place of working primarily in technology to asking myself the question of what was the state of the planet, what was the state of the environment, what was the future of that? Fundamentally, could we solve the challenges of food, water, energy, agriculture 
while creating room to have 10 billion people living first world lifestyles on this planet. And I authored this book, The Infinite Resource, that came out in 2013, it was most already in 2011. And what I discovered there really was exponential trends in the cost decline of clean technologies that I believe give us tremendous hope to be able to uh, not trade off economic growth versus the environment. Since 2014, I've been an investor in climate tech and clean energy companies. You see a partial list of the companies that I've invested in here. Uh, in the last handful of years, we've had four exits and one company is a unicorn now. Uh, and we've gone from investing piecemeal in these uh, in individual startups, which we still do, to launching our first venture fund, Planetary VC, that is focused on investing in this sector overall in technologies that can both make a better future for humanity and produce venture-like return. And the reason I decided to pick this sector to invest in, and the reason I wrote my book on this topic, a decade ago is really because we have substantial environmental challenges that affect us all. And the most pressing of those, it's not the only one, but the one that is overarching and growing worse all the time is what's happening with climate change. This is a chart of temperature change over the last 140 years or so. Uh, what you see is that the temperature rises, it's not monotonic. It doesn't go up every single year. There are ebbs and flows. But overall, since the pre-industrial era, we've warmed the planet by about 1.2 degrees Celsius. And this year, 2023, is not shown, it's literally the next line here, it will almost certainly now be the hottest year on record by a substantial margin. In July, was the hottest month we have ever measured on planet Earth in the last 130, 140 years. September was the most anomalous month we've ever seen. So the largest temperature uh, increase versus baseline, if you will. This summer, really, we've seen an acceleration of climate change. It could be temporary. Uh, it could be an anomaly that goes back to the, the overall line or it could be a sign of something worse. So the hour is getting late. We agreed collectively as a civilization that two degrees Celsius was the line beyond which we shouldn't go on climate. In later years, we've updated that to say 1.5 degrees Celsius is the line beyond which climate change becomes dangerous uh, or very dangerous. And we are going to pass that 1.5 degree Celsius threshold uh, probably in a transitory manner this year, and in a five-year average manner in the 2030s, most likely. Now, when I started in this sector in 2010, 2011, we thought of climate change primarily as something that would happen in future generations, and most of the impacts would be felt by our descendants. But what we've seen in just the last handful of years from forest fires in Australia, Canada, the US, Russia, drought hitting large parts of the world, record flooding in Pakistan or China, coral reef bleaching, a phenomenon we basically didn't know anything about from years ago, now threatening all of the world's shallow water, tropical reefs, potentially putting all of them into the permanent decline starting in the next decade, we see that climate impacts are here today. They are no longer just the future potential impact. They are something we are already wrestling with. Now, that having been said, when I came into this field in 2010 or so, we thought we might see six degrees Celsius of warming. There was actually a, a classic book written called Six Degrees four, five, six, something in there was the range that the models predicted. And that would be truly catastrophic. That would be not uh, extinction level event for humanity, but possibly inconsistent with civilization. 
inconsistent with large scale agriculture. And the good news is we are no longer headed for this. What's happened is that over the past decade, the incredibly rapid decline in the cost of clean energy that I'll talk about, coupled with policy changes that we've seen around the world, have bent the curve of warming. Here's a chart uh, that goes back uh, from original forecasts made uh, several years ago, showing that with no climate policies, we expected warming of somewhere in the four to five degrees C range. In the last 24 months, we've seen a number of papers that have looked either at na nationwide and national level pledges or just at no economic trends in the energy sector and have said that we are now on path for something substantially lower than this. It might be 2.9 degrees Celsius. It might be 2.5 degrees Celsius. It might be as low as 1.9 degrees Celsius. There's a very real chance that we can halt warming at below 2 degrees Celsius or just above it. So one of the things that I want to communicate is that there is tremendous potential for us to make changes here. We are now in a situation where uh, we are no longer on climate change, but we haven't done all the work that we need to either. And what we're going to see as a result is that as climate impacts become more and more obvious to everyone, we're going to see more push on policy, more push from consumers, more push from various businesses, and that's going to accelerate the trends in deploying clean energy. And that means that what we're looking at now is a $2 trillion, roughly, turnover in capital for the transition to clean energy, climate tech, if you will, and overall sustainability. And to put that in context, this is a chart from Bloomberg New Energy. This is looking at how much has, did the world spend on clean energy technologies across different years. And in 2004, the world spent $32 billion a year on clean energy, primarily on solar and wind. $32 billion is not small. That's a very meaningful market. But look at what happened in the growth in the next 18 years to 2022. In 2022, we spent between $1.1 trillion if you ask Bloomberg, to 1.4 trillion, if you ask the International Energy Agency, on the deployment of clean energy technologies, primarily solar and electric vehicles and the batteries for them. What we see is that the total spending in the sector has now has about a doubling time every four years or so. And if anything, that's accelerated in the last few years. A couple of milestones here in 2022 for the first time spending on clean energy technologies exceeded spending on fossil fuel extraction. In 2022, spending on deployment of solar exceeded spending on the extraction of oil. This is the first time we've ever seen this happen. And one of the things that I see as an investor is that capital chases growth, talent chases growth. We're going to see these numbers on clean energy deployment continue to rise around the world. And if they keep at this pace of doubling every four years, a 20 it could be about $4 billion a year in this industry, which would make it rival healthcare as one of the largest industries on planet. So this is really a generation defining economic shift. So let's start with looking at electricity, which is where we've seen the biggest shift. Because what's really happened here is an economic transition. This chart from Irene is showing the cost of clean energy technologies. The various dots uh, are on this uh, chart is of different types of solar and wind versus the cost of building new fossil fuel Power generation, a uh, coal powered plant or a natural gas powered plant. That's a gray band in the bottom. And what we've seen is in 2010, nowhere on planet Earth were solar or wind really cost competitive with fossil fuels without subsidies. But this incredible price plunge has happened. 
in 2010, we were still in the first phase of clean energy where it had to be subsidized. It was policy dependent. Around 2015, we entered a second phase where clean energy was cost competitive for a new power. And by 2020, we've started to enter this third phase where in many parts of the world, the cost of building new solar or new wind is cheaper than the operational cost of an already built natural gas or coal power plant. That's this third highly disruptive phase. And so that means that there's incredible now economic incentive to switch to this cheapest form of energy. And if you want to see the most clear example of that, it's what's happened in the solar panels in China. In 1975, per watt of power produced by a solar panel, you had to spend about $100 US. Today, that number has dropped to a global average of about 16 cents for an apples to apples comparison a solar cell, if you will. That, by the way, on the, the bottom right of the chart, you see what happened uh, in 2021. We had supply chain challenges, we had inflation and so on. And so we saw prices stop declining and shoot up, but then they came back down as the technology has just gotten better. So this is a, more than a 600 times cost decline in a fundamental physical technology. And we've never seen anything like this in the cost of any physical technology aside from computing and biotech. This is the physical infrastructure that we need to power manufacturing and hospitals, our homes. But the cost decline here is more like a cost decline of something digital than anything else. And that is something that simply was not predicted. You heard at the outset of this, I made some uh, forecasts on the, the cost of clean energy. And it's really because I came into this sector from technology that I could see a trend that looked more like technology developing. So in 2010, the National Energy Agency, the IEA, made this forecast in black for the cost of solar. Going out to 2050, they predicted the cost of solar power would drop by about half. I wrote an article for Scientific American in 2011, as I was working on my book, that looked at the cost of solar like you would look at the cost of computation. And it said, no, I believe that the cost of solar will drop at about five times the pace that the IEA predicts, and that we'll see solar power at two cents a kilowatt hour or less uh, by the middle of this century. People thought I was naive. People thought I was crazy. I had come in from technology. I'd never worked a day in my life in energy. And in fact, I was naive about many things. But I was also wrong. I was overly pessimistic. The actual cost decline of solar has been roughly twice as fast as the most optimistic forecasters of solar believed it would be just over a decade ago. And solar prices are now essentially a century ahead, a hundred years ahead of where the IEA thought we would be just 12, 13 years ago. That also means that we've seen the pace of deployment of these technologies far exceed official forecasts. Every year, the IEA puts out its World Energy Outlook and it puts out a forecast of many things. One of them is well, how much solar will the world deploy in every year going forward? Those are the colored lines. Every colored line is a different year of IEA forecasts of the size of the annual solar market. The black line is the actual growth, is the actual pace of deployment of the market. But I, this, this chart goes out to 2021. If we update that uh, to 2023, we see the same trend continue. This is really exponential, uh, is the actual market versus linear is the forecasting of the leading authorities uh, in this space. And in fact, this chart, it probably actually understates things. We expect closer to 400 gigawatts of solar to be deployed by the end of this year, if you ask Bloomberg. And that would put this off the top of this chart. This is a uh, forecast of you know, roughly half that from just 18 months ago from the IEA. 
So we are seeing the deployment of clean energy technologies just go exponential and go at a faster pace than, than forecasted. And it's not just solar. This graph shows on the left you know, the generation every year from wind power, then from solar, then annual electric vehicle sales in red, and battery storage sales in blue. And what you see is all of them are look like exponential growth right now. And in fact, uh, of course, the, the paces vary, but the growth of electric vehicles and of battery storage is actually an annual growth rate that is roughly twice that of the growth rate of solar. So this is just a market where we're seeing uh, incredible, incredible change. And it's powered in part by cost declines in these other technologies. Now, there are variabilities. Uh, I've got a picture of offshore wind here in the top right. Things have declined over the long term tremendously, but they've had a tough couple of years. We've seen costs go up in the last two years due to the cost of steel rising, inflation, higher interest rates, and so on. So we, we do see dips and valleys in these charts. But what we've seen in the past is the costs always come back down because fundamentally this is a technology. In fact, if you think about it this way, Oxford did this study, and they were coming up to share the data with me. Well, if you look at the useful energy and the cost of useful energy per megawatt hour from different sources over the last 140 years, Across the bottom, we have the cost of energy from coal, oil, and gas, fossil fuels. And what you see is no clear trend in the cost of that energy. These energy prices fluctuate. But you get technology advancement. We invented fracking, for instance. We made it cheaper to pull oil and gas out of the ground. But that competes against the depletion of these resources. So fossil fuels are a commodity, and commodity prices fluctuate. If we look at the cost of clean energy technologies, wind, solar, batteries, and hydrogen, that just shows a clear trend of cost decline. Because unlike commodities, unlike fossil fuels, clean energy is technology, and technology always gets cheaper over time. Uh, and now what we see is that's happening in the marketplace, about 90% of deployment of new energy, new power is solar and wind, the yellow and blue sectors. And that's just grown and grown and grown. Energy storage is coming on now. It's still a very small part of the pie, uh, but we've seen the price of lithium ion batteries decline by nearly a factor of 10 over the last decades. Again, you see a bit of a stalling out the last few years. That was caused by the rise in the cost of lithium that we'll come back to. But I wanna make the point that here again, the leading forecasters were just wrong. In 2013, the US Department of Energy made this forecast for how the cost of batteries would decline over time. And here's what's actually happened. In fact, that needs to be updated. That data point is now actually a bit low. So again, the cost of Lithium ion batteries is decades and decades ahead of where official forecasters thought it would be. Now, again, there are challenges here. Uh, one challenge that we see is we're going to need a lot more metals for the clean energy transition. Uh, this is forecasts of demand for things like copper and lithium and perhaps cobalt over just this decade in various decarbonization scenarios. And what you see, especially if you look at that lithium sector in the middle is the demand for lithium could rise by a factor of five from 2020 to 2030. And that has put uh, stress on these sectors. Now that comes down to actually creating an opportunity. One of my perspectives as an investor is every challenge is an opportunity. So one of the companies we invested in uh, back in 2019 was a new form of lithium extraction that could take existing lithium brines that normally would take two years to get the lithium out of and where you'd only get 30% of the lithium recovered and instead may operate this like a desalination plant, get two or three times lithium out in hours 
inside of years, you reduce the cost of lithium extraction. This is called direct lithium extraction. There's now several startups in this space, but actually every challenge in a clean energy transition is an opportunity because humanity is going to do this. And so we just have to find the ways uh, to do it. The next frontier in energy storage is really going to longer durations. Today, battery systems deployed to solar and wind average perhaps four hours of storage, but coming down the pipe, dozens of approaches, mechanical, electrochemical, thermal, to store energy for 12 hours, for 24 hours or longer. So some examples here, uh, this is uh, one of our portfolio companies went public in 2021, uh, an iron-based uh, battery chemistry uh, that doesn't have any rare metals in it. Uh, and that we think will be home power storage of $20 or $30 an hour, meaning it's incredibly cheap and can really solve the day-night cycle. Uh, Co-investors of Bill Gates, but Breakthrough Energy Ventures in that. Another company, Quibnet, uh, this company uses fracking technology to pump water underground and store energy as deflection of rock. So they get to use the existing fracking supply chain and labor force that exists to do this. Again, uh, Breakthrough Energy is investing in this company, as are we, and we see tremendous potential here. We're really the darling of long-term storage right now, Form Energy, another iron-based chemistry, aiming at not 12 hours of storage, but at 100 hours or more of storage. So four days of electricity storage, essentially they store the power as um, the transformation of iron to rust, uh, if you will. Uh, doesn't compete with electric vehicles for scarce metals in any way. Um, they are building their first two projects and a $750 million factory uh, to produce these things at scale right now. Now, again, there are many, many challenges as we think about this energy transition. It's not just the power demands that we have now. It's things like new electricity loads on the top right, electrification of transport that we'll talk about in a bit, uh, industrial decarbonization on the bottom right. That's going to, both of those are going to add to electricity demand. The grid itself has to be built out to transmit the power we need where we need it. We need to deal with the fact that solar and wind don't just have a daily cycle, they have a seasonal cycle. So look at that seasonal cycle. This is across North America, but something else, something very similar happens in most uh, places in the world. The yellow line is the production of solar power, uh, of theoretical production of solar power across the United States, across the months of the year. And you see it peaks, of course, sunshine peaks in summer uh, and is lower by about a factor of three in the depths of winter. Now, the good news is that wind in the purple is while it's low in summer, is actually quite high in winter and spring. So they are very complementary. But you're not, in most parts of the world, simply going to be able to build solar panels and depend on them for year-round power. We're going to have to merge multiple types of energy sources that are complementary or some that are weather independent, what we call clean furnaces, to be able to provide that year-round clean and stable power. So the, another way to think of it is, is this. Today, renewables are about 12, 13% of global power creation, modern renewables, solar and wind. Over the next decade, they're going to surge faster than ever, driven by economics and policy. So they're in the most exponential part of their growth we've ever seen. But they will also ultimately encounter some resistance, which is this question of in long, windless winter weeks, periods where there is no sun and where the wind stops blowing for 10 days at a time or more, how are we going to provide power in this time frame? Uh, and people mentioned various energy sources they are most excited about. And so when we look at the thermals to providing this last, let's say, last third of electricity, there's multiple pathways we could take, and we're investing in various ways in, in all of them. Continent scale grids to help address this. Massive renewables overbuild in some parts of the world could. 
multi-week storage, and there's other technologies down the road for that, or uh, what my friend Jesse Jenkins talks about is clean farm power. So nuclear power uh, fits into this. Uh, some of our small modular reactor nuclear power might reinvigorate nuclear. Nuclear fusion is coming down the pipe, though I personally don't believe we'll see it deployed at commercial scale until the 2030s. Uh, geothermal is now becoming something that where we think we see pathways to deploying geothermal power across a much wider set of geographies or essentially crazy ideas, but that are starting to look economically interesting, like space-based solar power. So the clean firm sector and solving this problem is both one of the most important problems for decarbonization and a massive economic opportunity uh, for those who can extract it. For me, one of the most obvious choices is to expand the grid. Uh, if you look at what we can do with grids and with transmission electricity, if you want to, uh, let's look at China. In China, the bulk of the energy demand is on the eastern seaboard, but the best solar and wind resources are in the west and northwest. And in China, the longest transmission lines are ultra high voltage transmission lines, DC transmission lines that go from Urumqi to Shanghai, more or less, is 3,400 kilometers. And if we apply this sort of thinking to other parts of the world, in Europe, that would mean being able to go from Sevilla to Copenhagen, something like that, um, transmit power, solar power from the south to the north, transmit North Sea wind energy back down uh, to the south and center of Europe. And in the US, we could literally take solar power from New Mexico to New York if we made a choice to build these continent scale macro grids. Uh, and that is uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm, that I'm most excited about. It may not be the path that we choose, but it's certainly uh, the one that looks most economically viable and certain in most. Okay. Now that's electricity. After electricity comes the decarbonization of transportation. And we see this happening roughly twice the pace that we saw the deployment of solar uh, and maybe three times the pace we saw the deployment of solar and wind together. It is now simply inevitable that the bulk of ground transportation will be electrified. It is a question of if this will happen. It is simply a matter of how fast it will happen. And the reason for that, I'll come to that in a second, but, but you see this in the numbers right now. We have seen an 80x growth in annual sales of electric vehicles around the world in the last decade. We're now selling more than a million of them a month. And the gasoline and diesel fire market for new, new cars already in 2017. All of the growth in passenger vehicle sales is electric. And again, capital chases growth and talent chases growth. We now see globally uh, of new vehicles uh, something like a 14% market share of, of vehicles being electric. That's still a small minority, of course, but look at how fast this has grown from almost nothing as far as recently as 2018 to just massive surges in the last handful of years. Again, it varies substantially from country to country, but this is just going to get faster. Uh, and it's certainly going to get faster than what official forecasters expect. Here's a forecast made by the U.S. Department of Energy in 2015. How many electric vehicles would there be on U.S. roads by 2040? And the red line is how many of them would have a range of 200 miles, roughly 300 kilometers. And the Department of Energy forecasted 20,000 them total, not annual sales, 20,000 uh, model three math cars that were electric on US roads by 2040. Tesla is selling a million cars a year. We're selling overall globally will probably sell 15 million electric vehicles in uh, 2023. This is about as wrong a forecast as you could possibly have made. 
And this area will see things continue to evolve even more rapidly because today, electric vehicle sales are driven by uh, personal lifestyle choices and policy and so on, but they're going to be driven more and more simply by cost. Electric vehicles will just be cheaper than combustion engine vehicles. And this is why. This is the engine and drivetrain of a gasoline-powered vehicle. Maybe a thousand uh, individual parts and a lot of moving parts in it. This is the engine and drivetrain of an electric vehicle. It has you know, less than one tenth the complexity of the drivetrain of a gasoline powered vehicle. So, made in bulk and with battery prices uh, continuing to fall, which they will, we will simply see these vehicles as lower cost. They're already lower cost to operate because the electric vehicle is tremendously more efficient. The gasoline or diesel vehicle loses three quarters of its energy as heat from the engine and from the friction of braking. The electric vehicle has hyper efficient electric motors. And when you brake, it sucks power back into the batteries. It's also a fraction of the cost for maintenance because it is such a simpler vehicle. So by the middle to the second half of this decade, perhaps 2026, 2027, on a global basis, we'll start to see the average cost of electric vehicles just dropping below that for a new purchase of gasoline vehicles. And what we'll see is that when we look at total cost of ownership, the electric vehicle will be cheaper to purchase and maybe one half the cost over a four-year basis to uh, operate and maintain, including the capital of purchasing that vehicle to begin with. And this will just further accelerate the pace of transition from gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. And it will extend from just passenger vehicles now into uh, medium duty uh, commercial vehicles. Those are vehicles by Rivian that Amazon bought 100,000 of because they know that it is lower cost in the long run to operate uh, these vehicles. And we'll see this extend even into the heaviest class eight trucks, semi tractor trailers that crisscross the country. Now, this, like uh, many other things, will put more electricity demand on the grid. In the US, if we electrify all ground transport, it would increase electricity demand by about half. So we're going to need more power generation and more transmission and more distribution. Uh, a charging site where multiple semi electric semis will have the same power needs as a small town. And that's going to force us to think creatively about how to circumvent issues with the grid or accelerate the pace of grid build out. Now, everyone uh, cares about the price of oil. So let's talk about the oil market because of the ways that we use oil, uh, ground transport dominates. And then there's some other sectors, uh, lubricants, still some heat and, and electricity that come from oil. So about two thirds of global demand for oil is at risk of disruption from these technologies. It won't happen overnight, but we start to see it happening right now. This is data from Bloomberg. And what Bloomberg is showing is that electric vehicles are already destroying about 1.5 million barrels per day of oil demand. Now that's only 1.5% of the market. I think the market is roughly 100 million barrels per day. Uh, but again, this is an area of exponential growth. If electric vehicles continue to grow at their current pace and uh, oil demand you know, or transport energy demand grows at its typical pace, we're seeing a crossover in the second half of this decade. Let's call it 2027. This is not a precise date. You know, uh, Assume some error bars here of plus minus a few years. But we are looking at the peak of demand happening around the world this decade. In fact, the peak of road fuels demand, you know, liquid fuels that we use for cars and so on, 
happened in China, we think, this year. It's happened in Europe already. It's happened in the U.S. already. And after that peak of oil demand, we'll see a continued deceleration and a faster and faster destruction of global oil demand. And again, capital chases growth. And this is going to be a very dangerous transition for the largest oil producing uh, nations. Now, uh, we're running a little short on time, but let me just say this. We have not addressed all of the challenges of climate change. A quarter of global emissions come from agriculture and deforestation. Uh, industry, heavy industry, like the making of steel and cement and chemicals, is a sector that's bigger than transportation on a global sector. We still have to address issues like building heat and so on. So all of these are frontiers in this energy transition. And the one that I think is the most interesting advancement recently is heavy energy. And a lot of that is driven by the potential to use hydrogen to decarbonize sectors like steelmaking. Uh, steelmaking is 8% perhaps of global carbon emissions by itself, three times the size of aviation. Now, hydrogen is uh, somewhat hyped right now. We have uh, some people thinking that we'll be able to use hydrogen for just about anything. We will see some uh, recalibration of expectations in this. We'll, we'll drop in this Gartner hype cycle into the trough of disillusionment. Uh, but hydrogen is still very useful. This is a, a chart from Bloomberg of different ways that you could use hydrogen. I don't think we'll use hydrogen for all of these sectors, but I do think we'll use it heavily for heavy industry, for making chemicals like fertilizer, where it's already a hundred billion dollars of hydrogen use a year, uh, for, as an ingredient for making fuels to put into existing planes and ships, and potentially uh, in the power sector for ultra long duration seasonal storage of power. And this will become possible in large part because hydrogen electrolyzers, the technologies that use electricity to split one, are themselves an exponential technology. They're dropping in cost. And the cost of the input electricity is also dropping substantially. So we're looking at green hydrogen dropping below the cost of gray hydrogen from fossil fuel uh, in the best markets. Uh, by uh, Ramesh, the floor is yours. Uh... We, we we noted there were some connection challenges, so I did uh, took the opportunity to share uh, the upcoming the book that we've just released. Let me just close by by making a few other observations, which are that policy is just getting more aggressive in this sector. Uh, what we've seen is that the war in Europe has coupled climate with energy security for Europe. Decarbonization is no longer just about the environment. It is now driven in European minds by the needs to be less dependent upon imported fossil fuels. And we've seen massive changes in policy in other parts of the world, like the U.S. So this transition is happening faster than ever. Thank you, Ramez. Uh, really appreciate it. I mean, I was saying I, I listen to you many times and every time when I'm listening, really the excitement just goes up because really the future looks uh, bright. Some people will say the future is exponential. So let's get to it. We have a few questions that came in. Let's start with first, uh, first to Antonio Martins, who is saying lithium, cobalt, and nickel are finite resources. How can technology deal with this constraint? Because of course, we're talking about green energy, but the battery that you were mentioning is primarily uh, sourced from lithium or cobalt of nickel. That's a fantastic question. Um, what we see is this. Number one, while they are finite in the Earth's crust, they are not destroyed by use in an electric vehicle. So if you, you take lithium out of the ground, uh, putting it in an EV doesn't destroy it. It just transforms it. And we see massive increase in uh, recycling technologies and recycling startups for uh, the battery sector in particular. Uh, in addition, we see a tremendous increase in investment in companies that have technologies to allow us to extract more of these metals from the crust 
with less impact and lower cost, and people changing chemistries. Cobalt is something that we saw many analysts saying they thought would go massively up in demand. But what's happened instead is that battery manufacturers have found new battery chemistries that don't depend on cobalt nearly as much. So demand growth for cobalt has, has not met the forecast people have had. Thank you. The next one, let's all go on. It's uh, something uh, from, uh, it's a great question, actually, I would say from Torres, I think, Nakazawa. And he said, do you, or he or she says, uh, do you think that companies net zero target will push hard to abate sectors to dec decarbonize faster than national policies? So would the company be the one pushing harder than the national uh, policies? Would it be both? What do you think? That is an that's a fantastic question. I think it is uh, uh, both. We see primarily uh, national policies and sort of subnational policies have been the big driver here, uh, and then the economics. But we also see companies in certain sectors pushing hard. And so the clearest example of that, I'd say, is uh, carbon capture, direct air capture. And it's not a net zero target that impresses me. It's when Companies actually put money down to actually invest. So what we've seen in the direct air capture market is two to three billion dollars of future purchase commitments from companies like Stripe and Microsoft that are really catalyzing this sector. Uh, and now that's being complemented by government money as well. Thank you. Let's move to the next one by Fredman, and that's take us uh, to Africa. And he says, have you, or he or she again, uh, have you done any study of energy preference in Africa and how Africa is faring in this disruption in energy sector? Yeah. So I'd say overall two things. One is Africa has the best resources of solar energy in particular of any continent uh, on earth and has the potential to energy property and have ultra low costs there. Uh, but that potential has not been realized. It is not being realized right now. In general, we are not doing well in the global south in deploying clean energy technologies. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is interest rates and borrowing costs are awfully high across Africa. Another is the grid itself uh, needs investment and build out. And a third, and I'm totally blunt, is that corruption and inefficiencies and mismanagement uh, in some parts of the continent uh, moving us back. If you look even at South Africa with the energy crisis that it's having now in a nation that has some of the best solar resource and wind resource on earth, uh, and their power company, ESCOM, has just mismanaged uh, that that system and is able to capitalize on that resource. Yeah, and one one open question, the, uh, not that I'm looking for an answer, could be the leapfrogging, because do you have to go through all the steps, or then do you really quickly go and embrace the new technology? Uh, let, let's get to the question from Miguel Zepada, and that's more like a comment. Uh, we've, um, we call all of them clean energy, but even when generating and using it may be cleaner, what about the story that we mentioned? And extracting additional material yeah. from the ground producing long-term waste is far from sustainable regardless of the state, color, smell, and the waste is produced. So what are we doing to avoid uh, the new problems and uh, at what pace is this growth or which of this technology is really cleaner? Miguel, that's an amazing, amazing question. Uh, what we do in the field is we do life cycle analysis. So we look at different technology pathways and we say from soup to nuts, from extraction from the ground all the way to delivery of the service to the consumer, what are the total impacts on the planet? And even though there, there are very real challenges with things like batteries, as you say, and the, the end of life of uh, batteries and solar panels and so on, nevertheless, we see a tremendous reduction, not just in carbon emissions, but in other sorts of harm. And on top of that, we see a massive wave of investments in technology and businesses to do things like get a second life out of electric vehicle batteries and then recycle uh, those materials uh, so that we can use them again rather than having them as waste. Uh, one example is J.B. Straubel, who was the CTO of Tesla, 
uh, his company, Red Web Materials, is now a multi-unicorn. I think they, they've raised around a billion dollars now. And every large auto manufacturer almost uh, has plans to have a second life for the batteries and then to have some battery recycling after that. Yeah, we have more questions than we can answer, but I'll throw two more and uh, we'll move on to closing. I'll take one from Margaret, and that is what are job opportunities that are out there with the explosion in the in, in, in Asia industry? But I would want you to go beyond even job, covering the job, but what new business model that you see mm -hmm. uh, with this uh, uh, explosion in the energy transformation, uh, energy tra uh, sector? Yeah. That's wonderful. So I'd say in jobs, a lot of the jobs really are construction, manufacturing, and deployment jobs. It's people that actually build everything from batteries to uh, solar and wind farms uh, and deploy them in the field. That's the greatest job sector. In terms of the, the broader macro picture, energy is a fuel of economies and lower cost energy just allows for more rapid economic growth uh, and for a faster reduction of poverty so that's the big picture thank you and then of course for all joining us of course if you are interested in investing the sec in the sector you know ramez is really big <laughs> investor in the sector so please do feel free to reach out to him uh, last question from daniel guerrero and uh, daniel is saying how do you see the outlook with new transmission lines construction taking into account public resistance to build transmission lines, because you were mentioning with 3,400 uh, kilometers. Of course, depending on countries, some, some places when you order it do, some places there are regulations or there are more public resistance that uh, could be an issue. What do you think? That's a fantastic question. And I'd say uh, it does vary from, from sector to sector, from region to region. Uh, China is doing a lot. Europe is doing better than the U.S. Uh, it's probably a pipe dream for me to see this continent-sized grids being built everywhere. But we do see some interesting things happening. Uh, for instance, there is a project being built in the U.S. now using a railroad line right of way, burying the transmission line underground along the railroad because there's already an existing um, sort of economic and permitting perspective right of way. And that uh, path solves many legal challenges and then burying the line uh, solves many public resistance challenges. It does increase cost, but it also increases reliability because you now you don't have to worry about a storm picking out loose transmission lines. So that's one possibility uh, for the future of transmission. Thank you so much, uh, Ramiz. Really, really happy about this great uh, transformation talk. Of course, uh, I hope you you inspired. I was inspired. You inspired many attending today. I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Now.